Hello, and welcome. My name is Larry Norris. Tonight, we're bringing you a special edition, a special event brought to you by ERI. ERI is a student group at the California Institute of Integral Studies. ERI stands for Entheogenic Research, Integration, and Education. You may have heard of entheogens from a different name before by the term psychedelics. Mm. Psychedelics uses mind manifesting, and entheogens, which is the term we use, it refers more to seeking the divine within, more of the spiritual aspect. With me today, I have three different members of ERI. Um, Adrian Aller, Veronica Hernandez, and Natalie Metz. Natalie Metz is a core member of ERI and a student in the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness Department at, uh, at CIS. She's in private practice in San Francisco, specializing in women's health, uh, endocrinology, and the use of botanical medicines. Her research is guided by a love of plants and healing arts, philosophy, as well as a conscious exploration of the therapeutic potentials of entheogenic experiences. Welcome, Natalie. Thank you. Next to her is Veronica Hernandez. Veronica is also a member of ERI and a PhD student in the East-West Psychology Department. She brings the shamanic cosmovision from her country, Peru, to her work with her clients as a spiritual counselor and shamanic journey facilitator. Her interests are to promote personal growth and self-discovery in people to create better relationships to themselves and the world. Welcome, Veronica. Thank you, Larry. And Sounds to my right cool. here, we have Adrian. Adrian is also a core member of ERI and a doctoral student in the East-West Psychology Department at CIS as well. His research interests are in integral psychology, consciousness studies, psychedelic studies, and energy medicine. His particular focus for his dissertation is on opiate addiction and its treatment with the entheogen ibogaine. Welcome, everybody. Hi, Larry. Hello. So I wonder, Veronica, could you tell me a little bit how about how your studies reflect, uh, or how the studies reflect your view of life? How you're, yes. you're, yeah. So, um, well, um, shamanism is my spiritual practice, and psychology is the profession I chose to do. I'm a therapist. So in this PhD program in the East-West uh, Psychology Department in CIS um, was an opportunity to bridge both practices, psychotherapy and spirituality. Uh, a lot of what has been happening is psychology and psychotherapy have lost that connection to spirit, mm -hmm. which is what shamanism brings, connection to spirit, to oneself, connection to others, connection to the world. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, and by bridging those two together, I think there is a personal transformation that happens in people. Mm. Somehow we, with the use um, and the teaching of plant medicines, um, the one that I mostly work with is ayahuasca. Mm. Um, it's a very deep way of knowing oneself and then discovering what could be the place in the world um, that you can have with that self-discovery, with transformation. It not only happens with experiences, but also there's a lot of aspects that we see in ourselves while we are in any kind of antigen. And a lot of those experiences need to be grounded in everyday life. Mm -hmm. And psychotherapy, especially transpersonal psychotherapy, is one that really facilitates that possibility. <clears throat> You mentioned ayahuasca. Could you explain maybe to the audience a little bit of what ayahuasca is? Ayahuasca is, yes, it's, um, it's an antigen. It's a, a plant medicine um, <clears throat> that comes from the jungle, Peru, Brazil, Colombia. And um, it's a brew. It's um, been used in rituals. It's been used in many contexts. And the context that I've used ayahuasca has been through the Shipibo tradition which is um, indigenous um, people in the jungles of Peru. Mm -hmm. um, this cloth right now represents um, part of like the ayahuasca visions. Mm -hmm. So ayahuasca is um, one of the master teachers in, in plant medicine. Mm -hmm. It uh, has healing, very um, healing properties. It's used for addiction, it's used for creativity, it's even used in my personal experience for um, doing healing in the spirit, in the in spirit and in sexuality. Mm. So, is that your focus, the spirit and sexuality? Healing? That is mm -hmm. my focus, mm -hmm. bringing spirit basically to everyday life, mm -hmm. but especially in that blend of sexuality and spirituality. Mm -hmm. Nice. 
This seems to be a little bit different than more of the traditional um, ways of using ayahuasca. Could you talk a little bit about this, 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 this sort of emerging, the merging of the sexuality and the spirituality you speak of? Mm -hmm. In more, um, what do you mean by more traditional? Um? Like um, traditionally, there's a, a, from what I understand, part of the dieta, for example, is yeah. to to have sexual abstinence before the actual journey space. So maybe could you talk a little bit about how sex works in or sexuality works in relationship yes, to and, medicine? Yes, and what I was referring was mm -hmm. mostly um, sexuality and spirituality. It's more as an energetic thing, not so much as the act of having sex. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are. Um, in the, the Shipibo tradition, yes, there is a dieta, mm -hmm. and one has to, you know, through foods, through certain foods, salt, caffeine, refraining from sex. And the explanation is one sometimes needs to keep their energy mm -hmm. in order to release and heal and connect to oneself. Mm -hmm. And there is an expression, obviously, of, of sexuality. Um, ayahuasca, what brings is brings a sensuality and brings um, a connection to your body that can be expressed in connection and a, an erotic aspect, mm -hmm. an erotic energy. Mm -hmm. uh, we can choose to have sex, we can choose to create anything, we can just choose to be connected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all this, the same energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Natalie? Wondering what attracted you to the entheogenic uh, research or the research that you're working with? Um, I will say that it actually attracted me um, in a way that I didn't even know would show up. I was uh, first really exposed to the world of um, entheogenic and psychedelic research while living in Santa Cruz a couple of years ago, um, meeting some people at a festival that worked for MAPS, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. and. I just became very interested in what they were doing. <coughs> and as I learned more about the organization, I came to understand that they are involved with funding research um, with clinical trials around the world for looking at the therapeutic value of different, they refer to them as psychedelics, but we might call them entheogens mm -hmm. as well. Their, primar their primary focus is the use of MDMA for the treatment of PTSD, and they've got a variety of studies around the world um, showing the therapeutic benefit of MDMA therapy, assisted therapy for PTSD victims, primarily uh, veterans. <clears throat> and so that kind of caught my attention. Um, being a physician, I'm always interested in learning what can help people and different modes and methods of healing. And through just kind of casual conversation, I came upon MAPS. And so I started to do some of my own research and read up more on the topic. and started volunteering with the organization and learning a bit about what they had to offer and then CIIS came on my radar in a very strong way and I learned about the Philosophy, Cosmology and Consciousness program <coughs> and that program seemed to be a good um, home for me to dive a little further into my own questions and so the questions that I've come to PCC with are around what, you know, what is some of this therapeutic potential what can people achieve? What types of healing can they actually experience within themselves with the use of entheogens or psychedelics? And um, so I've done some research into the realms of the healing that's been reported by people using ayahuasca, ibogaine, MDMA, mushrooms, cannabis, mm -hmm. DMT, LSD, and um, there's a lot of beautiful, beneficial information and reports out there. Mm -hmm. And so from the perspective of being a physician, it interests me, and then also just out of my own personal um, desire to awaken my own creativity and consciousness and evolve. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned healing. Yeah. Um, there's the PTSD with the MDMA, and you talk about also addiction therapy. Are there other types of healing that happen within this process? Yeah, there's um, some documentation of studies coming out of John Hopkins and other institutions that are using psilocybin, which has been extracted or synthesized from, um, extracted from magic mushrooms or synthesized, and that's been used uh, for end-of-life anxiety, so people who are making a mm -hmm. transition into, um, into their, facing their death are having um, some profound uh, resolution around their fears. And that's bringing some peace to not only them as individuals, but to their family and to their communities. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other research I'm aware of 
is the use of LSD for creativity. Um, Jim Fadiman is mm -hmm. one of the people that helped to spearhead some of that research in the 1960s before it got shut down. And um, <coughs> certain people say that things like the computer and the internet were mm -hmm. born out of that research. Mm -hmm. I've heard that before. Yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> So one of the things I am excited about in terms of what Erie has to offer and why we're all doing this together is that we're really providing a forum for education mm -hmm. and um, trying to dispel the myths that people have around mm -hmm. psychedelics. A lot of people <clears throat> excuse me, think of these things as drugs and think of them as destructive. And it's my opinion that it's, it's a lot in our approach. And so something can be a healing experience or it can be a traumatic experience depending on how one approaches it. Um, whether that's a certain medicine or um, an intimate encounter with a friend. So I'm really committed to providing people with information about how they can take care of themselves if they're choosing to engage in entheogenic practices and um, how they can integrate this information and the experience that they have into their life on the other side of the experience. So you're organizing a big event coming up soon. Would you like to briefly talk about sure. that? Sure. So this coming Monday, December 3rd, from time. 6 to 9 p.m. at CIIS, I'll be um, hosting with our other members of Erie um, a forum called Entheo, Entheo Health and Wellness Forum. Mm -hmm. We will have um, several speakers there. One person who will be speaking about the uses of essential oils and how they can help to induce um, altered states of consciousness, which can lead to entheogenic experiences, tapping into that divine essence within. Another um, participant will be speaking about the biochemical factory in our own mind mm -hmm. that is producing things such as DMT and other potential entheogens. Mm -hmm. And we will have um, the clinical director of MAPS giving us an update on the latest research mm -hmm. from the clinical perspective. And then we'll all be sitting on a panel and we'll have a little uh, sound healing ceremony and I'll be filling in with little tidbits that as we go. That yeah. sounds excellent. I'm it's going to be fun. For that. I'm yeah. excited too. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, we have Adrian. Adrian, the um, question I have for you is what do you hope to accomplish with your research that you're working on? <clears throat> well, Larry, my research has a very directed nature about it. Uh, my dissertation topic is specifically the treatment of opiate addiction with the entheogen ibogaine um, for the very simple reason that I was an opiate addict whose life was saved by ibogaine. <clears throat> Although, of course, I'm, I'm a Woodstock Nation kid, so I, I did a lot of journeying back in the day. I was not unfamiliar with uh, in theogens, although the term is relatively new for me, psychedelics, as I used to think of them. Um, in any case, uh, I had tried many things to escape my addiction and relapsed every time. Uh, when I did Ibogaine, it was completely different. The Ibogaine totally addressed all issues uh, of my addiction and gave me a freedom, a window of opportunity to begin doing the personal healing work that I had to do after a long time as an addict. And it gave me, uh, if you will, energy and a tool belt that I had not had before to do that work. So uh, instead of relapsing, I now have uh, over 15 years clean and have done most of my academic track record uh, since that time. For those that don't know what ibogaine is or ibogaine is, could you explain that to them, please? Absolutely. Uh, most of the entheogens that we address today are from the New World. Uh, ibogaine is the only um, African entheogen that I know of. It is the plant medicine of the Bwiti cult of the Fang peoples, who migrated in the second Bantu expansion from uh, northern Chad, where they used to be, to Gabon and Cameroon, where they are today, so they're deep jungle people. And when they wanted to know how to live in the jungle, they went to the jungle masters, the pygmies, and asked them, how do you live here? And the pygmies said, chew this root and you will see. Ibogaine, unlike all other uh, entheogens, is taken from the root of a shrub in the ground. Most of all the other entheogens uh, live and grow above ground in the air and the sunlight. 
So it is my speculation that uh, because ibogaine comes from the root of a plant and it's in the ground and uh, addiction takes you down into the plutonic realms, then it, that's why it's most uh, effective for the treatment of opiate addiction. Um, however, I don't, most people, well, some people go to Gabon to chew the root uh, as, the, as the Bwiti natives do, but uh, most of the treatment in the West with ibogaine uh, is from purified ibogaine hydrochloride. It's an alkaloid taken from the plant and produced into crystals that can be put in a capsule. So back to the original question of um, what do you hope to accomplish with the research that you're doing right now? Well, a, a very obvious and immediate thing is uh, ibogaine, like all other uh, entheogens, is illegal in the United States. But it's so beneficial for addicts that um, I would like to do what I can to advance the cause of entering ibogaine into the American pharmacopoeia so it's legal and, and uh, could be used in what I envision as uh, inpatient locked ward treatment. Uh, but that would make it uh, available to be paid for as a treatment by insurance, which would suddenly make this, uh, the treatment with this substance within the, the possibility of many addicts, because the alternative is you have to leave the country, travel some distance, go someplace else, and spend thousands of dollars, which of course most addicts don't have. So I would like to get it uh, legalized, but of course that means expanding the awareness and the understanding of the nature of this medicine and its possible uses in the minds of, well, the governing officials, the authorities of the government and the legal system, but also the uh, awareness of the public at large. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, and I, to give a little bit of background of where I come from, um, my research is in ayahuasca as well. Um, but I'm specifically focusing on the visual aspect of ayahuasca. Uh, I'm looking into uh, what's called the virtual reality scenes, which are um, very dynamic, active, interacting scenes that uh, the, the drinker goes through uh, for healing and spiritual growth. Um, but I think since we're all here and we're all talking about it's coming from so many different areas, I think it would be really fascinating to just have a little dialogue about uh, what we believe, how we see these entheogens as agents of transformation as we move on. And um, just kind of throw that out to anyone that'd like to take that. I, um, on a personal level, and working with people, and helping them integrate their experiences—experiences experiences done, obviously for the same reasons of illegality here in the country. A lot of experiences are done outside of the United States, and mm -hmm. you know, Peru is one of the places that people go, and. Um, can drink ayahuasca and other medicines. Um, I think those medicines help people view the world and themselves from a very different um, paradigm than the one that is right now happening, where is a world very disconnected, very individualistic, and um, it's the loss of soul and spirit mm -hmm. and the connection to nature, the connection to each other mm -hmm. in different ways. It's almost like we need to bring back a communal aspect mm -hmm. and as part of, of nature as well. I think these this medicines are the ones that give us an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And also, like um, what Adrian was saying, we need to do the personal work mm -hmm. to bring those experiences in our everyday life mm -hmm. to really change and have a different paradigm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or consciousness. We need it. Nelly, what do you think? Yeah. Well, I really see entheogens as one of the supreme forms of technology that mm -hmm. we have available to the planet and for use by humans. Um, I see that in clinical practice, a lot of people come in and are struggling with one or more alterations of mood, whether that's depression or anxiety or both. It's, probably about 80% of the people I see have some sort of um, probably underlying sense of despair about mm -hmm. their life. And um, I do think that there's a lot that can be accomplished through traditional psychotherapeutic methods, but I also 
feel that entheogens really accelerate the process mm -hmm. and that what can be accomplished in one ayahuasca session or a guided MDMA session can often replace six months of psychotherapy. So I think that they're very powerful tools that can really act as catalysts in personal transformation and in the collective transformation. And um, they also offer an opportunity for visioning. And visioning is something that has also been lost from our society. There's, there was a time, I believe, that we woke up and talked about what our dreams mm -hmm. were. And the dreams informed what the days work would be and um, now most people don't even remember their dreams and it's not about getting up and, and living into what your vision is, it's about getting up and getting what, done what needs to be done to fit into a model of kind of a rat race, at least in this country. Um, so I see that there's a lot of soul loss in people and we see that reflected in how people re, uh, treat the environment and the mm -hmm. degradation of the ecosystem and the loss of biodiversity, it goes on and on. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that in particular, the fact that many of these entheogens, I, I do believe that there's value in the synthetic chemical ones as well, such as LSD and MDMA, um, but particularly in the ones that come from the plant realm, I feel like they're compassionate, wise beings mm -hmm. that not only want to help humanity to awaken and preserve itself, but they also want to preserve themselves because they live on this planet. Mm -hmm. And ayahuasca, for example, is this amazing vine that has started to literally kind of creep and crawl around the whole world now. Mm -hmm. um, with its discovery by the West in the 1850s by Schultz and the ethnobotanists, um, in you know, the past 160 years, it's just kind of exploded into consciousness around the world, particularly in the past 30 or 40 years. And so my, my perspective is that ayahuasca itself wants to live in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why not? Mm -hmm. So now it's growing there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. with, I believe, a compassionate <clears throat> spirit of love for the whole of humanity and the whole of the planet and for its own self-preservation as well. So. Mm -hmm. I've heard many times the idea that uh, ayahuasca wants to be heard, and so it's, it's coming out and, and expressing itself through uh, the humans that are, are, are working with her, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah, so really interesting. Um, how about you, Adrian? How do you feel about entheogens in relationship to transformation in this era? <clears throat> well, Larry, I think that first, a transformation of the public consciousness about our, about the worldview, about the kind of cosmos that we live in is required to make everything we've been talking about here meaningful. Mm. <clears throat> we all live in an ensouled universe. We accept the presence of spirit <clears throat> in various forms and, and follow William James's uh, mention that there are so many other realities separated from us by the thinnest of veils that we can access. Uh, but if you were firmly locked into a completely materialist uh, worldview that says that everything is made out of matter and everything that we see has just happened meaninglessly by, by random chance, then everything that we've been talking about here tonight would be ridiculous to talk about ayahuasca wants to be heard and plant teacher has a message for us. Well, that's meaningful for us, uh, but we are united in this worldview. Mm -hmm. And partly, I imagine, because of our own personal experiences with entheogens, who, uh, which can offer a vision of an alternate possible reality, um, but you have to accept that in order to make anything of it. So in Erie, we address uh, research. Obviously, we're all doing research of one sort or another. We address integration, because if we have these experiences and don't work to make that experience a meaningful part of our life, which means doing the hard work of change, uh, then it, the value is lost. And education, we are all engaged in trying to educate um, the public at large that many of the the things that they think they know about psychedelics are actually some kind of hysterical and untrue propaganda, and that they are uh, much less dangerous, though not without uh, serious concerns, not something you'd want to do casually, 
but um, that they're not as dangerous as they've been made out to be and that they do have, like they're all, most of them are all schedule one uh, legally, which means they are highly addictive and have no medical value. Whereas the truth is just the reverse. Mm -hmm. So part of our jobs, all of us, in our own ways, is to spread this information and, uh, and have people know that there is a medical value and personal, spiritual, and transformative possibilities available through these excellent plant medicines. I noticed you touched on the idea of plant teacher, and this is sort of a conversation we've all had individually. I wonder if maybe each of us individually can talk a little bit about our connection with plant teacher and, and maybe experiences that involve that. Well, I, I will talk about um, specifically ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's uh, many authors and, that have um, you know, studied um, accounts of people and their experiences with ayahuasca. And a lot of the times it seems like if ayahuasca gets in the person, and it's almost like it, it teaching them how to feel, mm -hmm. how to look inside, how to connect. And it's almost like it has a life of its own. You know, we can have intentions when we go and drink ayahuasca, but it's almost like she has she really has a way of teaching mm -hmm. that sometimes it's beyond our, beyond what we think we either accomplish or that we could feel or how we could hold it. And it seems like in many sessions, um, we can get healing, we can get insights and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. It's almost like she has a, and she does have a life of her own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Natalie? Well, I have an ongoing, lifelong love affair mm -hmm. with plants in general, uh, whether that's a house plant or something in the mm -hmm. garden. Um, and a couple things that I like to mention about plants is that, number one, they are the only energy producers on the planet. Mm -hmm. So they are the only beings on this planet that make glucose and that have the ability to transform sunlight mm -hmm. and carbon dioxide into sugar and oxygen. And that is pretty miraculous in and of itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we are completely reliant on them for that sugar, even if we're eating animals, animals are eating plants. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we're also completely reliant on them because they're producing oxygen. Mm -hmm. And without them, we couldn't exist. Mm -hmm. We would just expire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so those are two kind of biochemical reasons why I love plants. Mm -hmm. um, I've also been studying herbalism for over 10 years, and I'm extremely passionate about the use of plants in a healing arts practice, and so I use um, plants for their pharmacological actions, for their physiological properties, and also for their spiritual dimensions. Very often when I'm custom formulating um, a remedy for a patient, I will include a few drops of a certain plant because of its energy and its spirit. And mm -hmm. so um, plants can be teachers in that way, used for medicinal aspects, and obviously the entheogens um, can be teachers on such a grand level. Mm -hmm. um, ayahuasca certainly comes to mind um, in my experience being a teacher about nurturing mm -hmm. and self-care and nourishment. Um, I've described ayahuasca as being held in the arms of the Divine Mother. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe each one of them has their unique way mm -hmm. of um, being a teacher and considering where a plant grows, what its morphology is like, what um, conditions it likes to live in can give clues to how that plant can help one to unearth and deal with things in their own psyche, in their own body, in their own consciousness. So whether it's using an above ground portion or the root, as Adrian referred to, um, there's a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. um, for someone with a, such a wide range of knowledge about plants, do you find that certain plants have, uh, you hear this often, but certain plants having personalities or certain archetypes that are specific to those plants? Could you talk a little about that? Yeah, absolutely. There's um, a concept in the realm of herbalism called the doctrine of signatures, which mm -hmm. refers back to uh, what I was just saying about a plant will often present in its shape and where it lives what it might be good for. Mm -hmm. And um, all of my teachers 
in the realm of herbalism have said, if you want to learn about the plants, go and be with the plants. Mm -hmm. So this concept that the plants themselves will communicate with you and people who have studied this in more depth really believe that the communication that happens between plants and people is on an empathic nature, that we will often, often get impressions of um, an emotive quality. So there may be feelings or emotions that come up in the presence of a plant, whether ingesting it or just simply sitting with it versus working with animals tends to be more of a telepathic or mental aspect to it. Um, so in my experience, they've been teachers on all levels, whether it's something that I'm ingesting for a medicinal or entheogenic purpose, or whether it's sitting and admiring a rose. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Sure. Adrian, have you had any experiences with my teacher? Well, sure. Um, when I initially went and, and took uh, Ibogaine uh, for my addiction. I was uh, pretty far gone. I was almost dead, which means that I had been effectively dead as a human being for at least the preceding decade, walking around as a kind of a white zombie. Um, and most of the other people, I had the opportunity to speak to at least 20 or 30 other people who uh, were treated at the same place uh, afterwards and get there uh, to sh compare notes. And uh, all, virtually everybody that said they had a good experience all agreed that they also, as I did, had a clear and distinct impression that there was another consciousness present within us, uh, a non-human vegetal consciousness, another entity that, that had entered us when we took the medicine um, and in this case, plant teacher became plant doctor mm -hmm. and looked around and did a diagnosis and prescribed a certain experience for each of us. That's um, a feature of entheogens that you don't always have the same experience, even if you're the same person taking the same substance and the same dose on two different occasions. The, the, you know, the way you are different between one occasion and the next will produce a different experience. So here we were, a variety of different people from different backgrounds. Uh, we all had the same problem that was being treated. Uh, but we had different experiences, but there were certain things in common. And one of them was the sense of the presence of another, another non-human, not-me entity mm -hmm. that was in me during the course uh, of taking this. And I will say that in the case of Ibogaine, it has very long-lasting after effects, uh, which is valuable because one reason it's hard to break out of addiction is that you're so locked into a regimented way of thinking uh, about the world and behaving. This is what the AA folks call stinking thinking. You just, it's impossible to think your way out of it. Um, so uh, if in my case, even though on the one hand I felt that, that the Ibogaine had really addressed all the aspects of my addiction. And uh, they were all held in abeyance for a period of time while the long, uh, the lingering after effects of the treatment were present. And eventually they would go away. And if I had not established a new way of being in the world and thinking and feeling in that time frame, then I could relapse ultimately mm -hmm. when it wore off. Uh, so, but I had an extended period of many weeks where I was very flexible and open to, to change, to taking suggestions and doing all of that. Uh, so I just, th everybody that I saw that came back from the island, well, where we had to go to take this, uh, and was glowing and saying I had a great experience, all agreed that they too experienced the presence of this other entity. So that's what I mean when I say plant teacher. Mm -hmm. I took a lot of LSD when I was a hippie and there was never that sense of a separate entity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. There were many, there were commonalities of effect, but there was not that. So mm -hmm. I think that the plant teacher is, is associated with the plants, right? Mm -hmm. As Natalie said, uh, they all have their own something to give you special, you know, and they know what it is. Mm -hmm. It's up to us to find it out. Mm -hmm. And plants have a history of use in every culture mm -hmm. around the world. Every culture has a tradition of using plants for healing and divination mm -hmm. and medicine. And 
um, the birth of pharmaceuticals in the past hundred years that's really kind of taken over modern medicine is very new. And many of them are even de derived from plants. But mm. the tradition of using plants as medicine is, in all varieties of contexts, is ancient and mm -hmm. uh, will hopefully live in well into the future. <laughs> yeah. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Adrian Aller, Veronica Hernandez, and Natalie Metz. And thank you, folks. Have a wonderful evening. And uh, if you're ever around CIS, check out Erie, Entheogenic Research, Integration, and Education. Our website is www.erievision.org. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>